Uh, I'd like to start with thanking the organizers and ICDP for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about uh, 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 some attempts or some studies that we have recently carried out. Uh, in understanding the microstates of, uh, or we are hopeful that it will lead to understanding of the microstates of extremal black holes. So this is the uh, paper in collaboration with two of my students and Jeffrey Comper. So that's the outline. Uh, I'll first try to motivate why this uh, question, a uh, question of studying black holes, and it's uh, trying to understand the. Uh, source of the thermodynamical behavior that the black hole shows is, is important. Then uh, I'll go through uh, this specific example that I'm going to discuss about. That's basically a geometry which is related to ex extremal black holes. Then uh, I present you uh, the three laws of uh, NHEG mechanics, which basically parallels those of black holes. Then uh, I move from this classical uh, purely GR classical picture to uh, uh, one step ahead, uh, basically trying to construct the, what I call the phase space of this uh, uh, geometries. Then I'll tell you about the uh, conserved charges and associated algebra and uh, try to eventually argue that why it should be all relevant to the microstates of black holes. So uh, this <coughs> There are uh, more than 40 years of work basically trying to establish a connection. Uh, the fact that uh, semi-classically black holes are uh, behaving like uh, thermodynamical systems. You can associate the temperature to uh, the black hole and other chemical potentials to the horizon of the black hole. Uh, then you can, uh, you can associate charges, basically. These are like noether charges that you can associate with the black hole. They are defined at infinity or asymptotics of the space, whatever it is. And eventually, you can associate an entropy, again, as a conserved charge to the horizon. And uh, these uh, thermodynamical concepts and quantities, of course, satisfy the uh, laws of thermodynamics. Uh, a black hole could be hence viewed as some system at a fixed temperature. It, uh, has a black body radiation, that's the Hawking radiation, and we know that within Einstein GR plus uh, semi-classical uh, quantum field theory coupled to Einstein GR, uh, uh, that any matter, almost any matter, with gen generically it go undergoes the gravitational collapse, and uh, then after bl black holes formed, uh, basically they uh, how can radiate and completely evaporate? But the problem, which was also alluded to uh, yesterday, is that this process of formation and evaporation of black hole is not unitary. Uh, but then, we, in the standard physics, we have another p uh, part of the physics, which uh, the, uh, basically, although the underlying physics is unitary, the, at the surface, in thermodynamical limit, we don't see unitarity. And the non-unitarity arises because of, as an artifact of taking the thermodynamic limit. So let's entertain the same idea. Could be that in black holes, we have a similar feature, that the there is some underlying physics, which is unitary. But uh, in the black hole description, we are dealing with some thermodynamical limit, and we don't see unitarity manifestly. Then uh, there is also a law, which has several arguments behind it. And that's basically the microstates of, or that underlying system of the black hole uh, are uh, basically residing uh, on the horizon. So there are, uh, if you focus on the horizon, you, would, you should be in, in principle able to see uh, where the microstates are. So that was just for the general picture. Uh, usually there's a laboratory in the set of black hole solutions, the extremal black holes, these are, uh, which are used to study or address these kind of questions. The reason why they are interesting is that they are at zero temperature, they do not Hawking radiate, and hence there, there, there is no evaporation. So uh, they, they are much easier to study if you want to address the question of the microstates. Then uh, there are, uh, the, these black holes are essentially what we are focusing on. Uh, Although they are at zero temperature, they do, they do have non-zero entropy generically. And uh, 
it's also related, they could also be related to uh, candidates of black holes that we see in the sky. So it's not just pure uh, theoretical studies. The, then within the set of extremal black holes, there are uh, supersymmetric black holes, which even gives you more control uh, over uh, the system, and you can study the microstates even better. I, actually, for a certain set of uh, supersymmetric black holes, the project of microstate counting has been carried out successfully, first in uh, 95 by a seminal paper of Strominger and Waffa, and since then many people, including Ashok Sen have contributed to this. Uh, just to give you an idea of the general picture of the microstate counting attempts that has been carried out, there are two different approaches, which I have called uh, top-down and bottom-up. In the top-down approach, basically, they try to embed or model the black hole in some theory of quantum gravity, uh, for example, string theory. And uh, this uh, approach only to, to date uh, works for the BPS, uh, but there are many attempts to basically go beyond the BPS black holes. Then there is the bottom-up approach, and basically the uh, uh, idea here is that let's uh, try to start from the gravity and try to add semi-classical features and see how far we can get. So there are examples of top-down is, of course, the Strominger uh, Waffa, the uh, D1, D5 system, uh, what Ashikson has been doing, uh, and collaborators, including Atish uh, Dovalkar. And uh, for some certain BPS ADS5 black holes. Then uh, examples of the bottom up approach are, uh, I've given two examples, but there are more. Uh, this, the standard care CFT, uh, and the ideas by Cardi, basically. Uh, these are relying more on the um, geometric gravitational picture. But uh, generically, in either of these two approaches, the microstate counting is relying on uh, using Cardi formula, finding some uh, 2D CFT, or identifying it, uh, the central charge of it would be 2D CFT, and basically uh, trying to reproduce the entropy. Here I'll be just giving another bottom-up uh, example. So that's uh, what we are doing here. Uh, okay. The, the geometries that I'm going to focus on uh, are not exactly black holes. They are related to these black holes. They are near horizon geometries associated with extremal black holes, uh, for short, NHEG. Uh, these are a class of solutions to GR with uh, SL2R across some U1 isometries. And they could be BPS or not, but uh, what I'm really focusing on here is uh, not the supersymmetry, so the supersymmetry will not be so relevant to my discussions here. And uh, basically the idea is that, as I mentioned, uh, we believe that the microstates of the black hole should be residing on the horizon. So if you focus on the horizon and consider the energy EG, it should be enough to, uh, for, the, uh, for understanding the microstates of black holes, or at least counting them, if you don't specify it explicitly. But then uh, there, are, there have been many attempts within this set of geometries uh, relying on the fact that you have SL2R and geometrically that corresponds to some ADS2. Uh, I'll show you the metric in a second. Uh, and, there are, and then try to use ADS2 CFT1 for doing this counting. But there are various issues associated with this duality and that project has not been really fruitful today. So uh, Basically, uh, I'll try to uh, take an, a completely different route, not using ADS2 CFT1. Actually, I'll try to argue that ADS2 CFT, ADS2 CFT1 would be misleading for this specific class of uh, geometries. Uh, okay, so these NHEGs are not uh, black holes, meaning that they do not have event horizon, but actually we showed that there are infinitely many bifurcate killing horizons in this geometry. So uh, although they are not black holes, they show some properties that are useful for basically uh, carrying out the standard GR analysis, as we'll see. Then there are uniqueness theorems, as we have for some black holes. And more importantly, actually, there are uh, uh, perturbation uniqueness theorems, or uh, oftentimes called uh, no dynamics theorems. The, and the essence of this uh, no dynamics theorems is that 
uh, on, the on this energy G geometries, uh, you have an ADS2 part, and uh, you cannot uh, really turn on uh, fluctuations on the ADS2 part, which uh, uh, do not destroy the asymptotics of the ADS2. The uh, reason is very simple, that ADS2 is just two-dimensional, and uh, basically it, it does not afford putting any fluctuation on it. So th there is no normalizable uh, fluctuation on the ADS2, which satisfies the uh, standard boundary condition. So that's the statement of this node dynamics. OK, so these are the facts that we know about the NHEG. So let me just focus on a specific class of uh, NHEGs, which are the vacuum solutions in generic D dimensions. Uh, so this is the generic form of these uh, geometries. There is, uh, the blue parts are associated with the ADS2. And uh, this red part is associated with the U1s. And these gammas are some functions which you, could, you can determine if you impose the equations of motion. And these are the SL2R uh, cross U1 killing vectors. Uh, OK. Uh, these geometries, so let me go back here, uh, are specified by this set of vectors. Uh, so these are the minus three-dimensional vectors, k. So remember that. We'll come back to this. OK. Then uh, there are d minus three number of angular moment associated with either uh, of these u ones, and actually I told you that uh, there are infinitely many uh, killing uh, horizons, and they are generated by this killing vector field for each and every given point uh, on the ADS two. So this T H and R H are arbitrary, and so uh, basically for any arbitrary T H and R H we have uh, a killing horizon. And uh, interestingly, all of these different killing horizons have the same surface gravity. So irrespective of where you are on the ADS2 sitting, you see the same thing. And actually, this is the key point that I'll be using in my construction. So just to give you this, how the space-time, the causal structure of the space-time, so that's basically the R and T uh, part of the space-time. I've suppressed the D minus two-dimensional H surface. Uh, uh, and uh, there are also some discrete symmetries. And basically, what uh, all different points on this space, uh, as far as the microstates are concerned, should be equivalent. So that's basically the basic idea. This is why you should not be able to use uh, ADS2CFT1. ADS2CFT1 is basically trying to put uh, the uh, dynamics or whatever it is in this ADS2 part. But that's not possible. So. Uh, this is just the flow of uh, this vector, uh, killing vector is zeta h. So uh, here we have you know, bifurcate killing horizons, no matter where you are sitting. OK, so uh, let me just briefly mention the laws of uh, energy G mechanics. Uh, so uh, the surface gravity for all these h surfaces and a constant t and r surfaces are uh, equal. Uh, you can associate the conserved charge uh, to uh, this, I mean, this conserved charge associated with this killing vector zeta h, which is the entropy, and, and it satisfies this relation. So that's the first law of uh, energy G mechanics. Then uh, we have the entropy perturbation law, which states that if you have any perturbation, uh, like delta phi, phi is a generic field, uh, which satisfies these two conditions, it's invariant under two of these SL2R generators. Uh, the associated entropy perturbation and the angular momentum perturbation is related in this way. So, uh, so far for the background, now uh, I want to tell you how you know, we can think of these microstates or where they can come from. That basically uh, means that we want to construct the phase space of fluctuations around the energy. So uh, basically, the idea is that the, uh, this phase space, which could be relevant to the problem of microstate counting, uh, should be viewed as some uh, fluctuations on this given metric. And these fluctuations, uh, as I mentioned, they, they could not be physical fluctuations, which carries a non-zero energy and non-zero ang angular momentum perturbation. And hence, we are confined to uh, consider diffeomorphisms. 
But uh, in the standard GR, we are told that uh, stand, uh, all the geometries which are diffeomorphic are physically equivalent unless you can associate non-trivial charges to these fluctuations. And that's exactly what I'm going to tell you and show you, uh, basically, that there are some set of diffeomorphic metrics which are not physically equivalent. And that's basically how I construct the phase space. So uh, basically, I uh, construct my phase space through some diffeomorphisms. That these are the infinitesimal form of the diffeomorphisms. And they, I show you the finite form of these diffeomorphisms. And I show you the explicit form of the metrics, of course. So just for the notation, uh, I'll be using uh, the vector in, uh, notation to denote this ki and ji. These are the d minus three dimensional uh, vectors. The dot is basically the dot in, on these vectors. And then the, this round or partial e is basically uh, uh, the durational derivative along these phi i's. And the background metric that I'll choose is basically in this coordinate system that I showed already the metric in that coordinate. OK. So this is the form of the uh, diffeomorphisms. The, this is a uh, vector field which generates the, my phase space. There is a function epsilon of phi, which is a function of all these uh, d minus 3 variables. And of course, uh, my met perturbations are uh, generated by standard uh, lead derivative. This phi bar, in my case, is just the metric, the background metric. So uh, you may ask, this is a very specific diffeomorphism. And the way I uh, fixed it is basically trying to impose these conditions. The first condition means that all the, uh, I'm imposing the fact that uh, all different points on the ADS2 are physically equivalent. That's what it amounts to. They are volume preserving, meaning that the divergence should be zero. Uh, they are preserving the form of the ansatz that I met, showed. Basically, the variation of the Lagrangian top form is zero. They also keep the horizon structure. That's what I need to require. And I want all these metrics that, or all these uh, geometries that are produced through these diffeomorphisms are smooth. So that's also a strong condition. And more importantly, I want the, there should be integrable and well-defined conserved charges associated with these diffeomorphisms. Uh, so actually, uh, through solving this equation, which is basically uh, uh, requiring that I want the form of the diffeomorphisms to be invariant all over the phase space, fixes the um, finite transformations. So I showed you this infinitesimal transformation around some given point in the phase space. Now I'm basically giving it through this generic uh, transformation. So it, this transformation is specified by a single function, which is a periodic function, and a psi function, which is defined through the derivative of this phi. And uh, just to show you explicitly, one can re readily see from this that the uh, null direction, which is given by this combination, is uh, remaining uh, invariant. So these are basically the set of uh, metrics. This is a one-parameter family of uh, metrics, which are specified by this function f. And there are elements in my phase space. And let me speed through this. So schematically, basically, these are uh, the set of all these geometries are diffeomorphic to this specific point. This is the metric that I started with. And uh, this plane is basically constructed through uh, the diffeomorphisms that I just mentioned. All the points on this uh, plane have the same angular momentum ji, because they are built through diffeomorphisms, and ji is a physical charge. So uh, that's basically where my phase space is. And importantly, the, uh, one can readily, given this chi's, the generators of the phase space, you can find the Lie bracket of these two chi's. Uh, and this is basically the algebra of the generators. And actually, there is a strong theorem that uh, the algebra of the charges, if you can uh, have a well-defined charges associated with this, is going to be the same thing up to some central extension. So I'll be uh, going through the details of this. OK, so I need to make this to a phase space, I, this set of metrics to a phase space. I need to give you the symplectic structure. Symplectic structure is a, a 
two form, which should be finite, closed, and non-degenerate over the space-time. And, uh, and it's a d minus one form in the space-time. Uh, so it's a two form on the phase space, on the tangent space of the phase space, to be more precise. So uh, these are ta tangent uh, vectors in the phase space, the variations of the fields. Delta is an exterior derivative on the phase space. D is a standard exterior derivative on the space time. And uh, there is this very elaborate uh, machinery of covariant phase space method uh, developed in these papers uh, that basically allows us uh, to construct for any given uh, diffeomorphism invariant theory to construct the uh, symplectic structure. And uh, so that's, uh, let me just give you very briefly how this works. Uh, one can define a pre-symplectic potential whose uh, delta derivative uh, makes the omega, so that's the symplectic structure. And uh, basically, for a given Lagrangian, you can uh, define this theta, uh, the pre-symplectic potential, in this way, through uh, just given the Lagrangian. But uh, this only defines it up to some uh, boundary terms, which are basically uh, defined in this way. So, so th basically what we have shown is that there exists some well-defined Ys, which uh, makes this set of metrics into a well-defined phase space. So uh, the consistency conditions on this omega uh, is that they should be closed on shell, and actually all over. Uh, not only d of that should be zero uh, on shell, uh, omega itself should be zero because we want the, the flux of this to be vanishing. Uh, so that's the conservation condition. The integrability condition amounts to having this, and uh, the, there is a very standard but uh, very uh, straightforward, tedious, long uh, algebra to show that there are some y terms which does this job for us. So the, you can see, you can find the details in this paper. Okay, uh, then there is the fundamental theorem of a covariant phase space method which basically tells us that omega on shell is d of some two form. And through this k, uh, you can define the variation of charges. And if the charge is integrable over the phase space, uh, through this delta h, you can f define uh, or construct h itself. So in principle, I have given you how you to construct omega, to con how to construct k, how to construct h. And now I give you the uh, result. And uh, basically, if, you, if these H's are the charges associated with these uh, transformations that I introduced, this is the algebra of this, which is exactly the, the algebra of the uh, vectors chi, the generating vectors, up to the central term. And there are ways to compute the central term in this covariant phase space method. It's basically standard. And uh, we computed that, and actually the, the f central charge appears to be the entropy of this object. So that's how it is. So uh, basically, uh, so I gave you the algebra of charges, but you may also ask whether I, for any given element in uh, this set of metrics, I can specify what's the charge associated with that. And this is basically to give you the answer is yes, we can specify explicitly what are the charges in terms of this function psi, which appeared in the metric. So uh, these charges are Fourier transforms of this, uh, you may call it a stress tensor, T, which has this form. So for those of you who are familiar with the Liouville theory, this is basically very uh, uh, similar to what you would call it, uh, Liouville stress tensor. But here the fields are d minus three dimensional, uh, unlike the standard Liouville. And this is the directional derivative. So, and this psi in this setting resembles a uh, weight one field. Okay. Uh, so far, it was just classical phase space, classical uh, symplectic structure. Uh, but you can use standard quantization in this way and basically promote these charges to algebra of generators. And of course, the algebra that you would find is basically this one. 
And the uh, phase space, uh, the energy phase space that I constructed just by construction is invariant under the symmetry group. So uh, let me just give you some more words on this energy G algebra. So it uh, resembles a Virasoro algebra, but it's not Virasoro, of course, because uh, here uh, the indices and the generators are vectors. They are not just numbers. They, they, they are basically points on the lattice, on a D minus 3 lattice. These vectors, K, that uh, I showed you, uh, they appear in the uh, geometry, appears as the uh, structure constants in this algebra. And importantly, the entropy appears as the uh, central charge. So uh, there are, uh, let me just give you some more uh, words on this algebra. So this is a new kind of algebra that we have found through this study. It has not been identified in the physics or math literature before. Uh, if uh, we are in four dimensions, k is just a number, is not a vector. And it, when k is just a number, these are uh, numbers, and this reduces to standard Virasoro. But for higher dimensional cases, uh, this is a, a different object. And actually, this algebra has infinitely many Virasoro subalgebras. And you can, uh, I've given the construction how it goes. So for any given direction on the lattice uh, by this vector E, you have uh, uh, a Virasoro subalgebra. And there are infinitely many such directions. So it, it's a real extension of the Virasor. OK. So uh, let me try to summarize and try to give an outlook where we are heading. So uh, I showed you how one can construct the phase space of uh, geometries, uh, which are all diffeomorphic to this uh, a given energy G. Uh, these are one family set of geometries specified by a periodic function, f, that we call the Weigel function. And uh, schematically, basically, uh, given a family of the energy Gs, which are uh, specified by the value of angular momenta, uh, that's basically the geometry which I denoted by G bar. Uh, you can construct the phase space uh, by applying the diffeomorphisms that I just gave you and construct the whole phase space through that. But the point is that for any given uh, point in the phase space, you can associate non-trivial charges. These are basically charge under the algebra that I showed. Okay. But uh, these charges are well-defined because uh, and this set of geometries provide us with the uh, phase space because there is a well-defined symplectic structure. And uh, the algebra of the charges associated with these geometries is an extension of the Virasoro, and the entropy is uh, the central charge. Uh, note that there is no usage of Cardi formula. Entropy directly appears as a central charge, and this is how it is different than all the previous attempts, conceptually different. So uh, let me uh, the, perhaps for those of you who are familiar with the Kerr CFT uh, analysis, this is very close to that, but let me uh, try to compare that with the Kerr CFT. First of all, we are giving the phase space. It's not just a set of perturbations with a given fall of behavior. We co completely specify the phase space. Our symmetries, hence, are symplectic symmetries, they are not asymptotic symmetries. Uh, of course, any asymptotic symmetry is, uh, any symplectic symmetry is asymptotic, but not the other way around. Uh, second, uh, our, mm, the entropy appears as the central charge, and our central charge is not, an, or the algebra is not an extension of the isometry of the background, as it is in the CFT. Uh, actually, our phase space is completely invariant under this isometries of the background because th these are a set of geometries which are uh, constructed through the feomorphisms. And we are treating all these U1 directions in a democratic way. That's not what appears in the care CFD. So uh, then I introduced the uh, representation of the charges. 
in terms of this Liouville field. And you may uh, ask uh, what's the role of the, this Liouville type field here in this setup. Uh, the interesting thing is that the, there is an, uh, the, in this set of HNs, the H0 is positive definite and it could be viewed as the Hamiltonian over this phase space. And that's basically the, the idea which could be useful. Uh, so that's basically one of the directions that we are exploring. Uh, then the, there could be many interesting uh, extensions of this idea, for example, uh, extensions to uh, other extremal geometries. And uh, finally, whether it's related to microstates of black holes and whether this Liouville theory has anything to do with the microstates, uh, that remains to be seen. Probably that's, uh, at the moment, the co only comment that I can make on this issue is that it will, this Liouville type theory would be the long string sector of whatever that quantum theory is. Thank you very much. Questions? Comment? So, so normally, in the if you study uh, Virasoro representations, then you come up with the with the, the formula by looking at the dimension of the module. But in your case, the entropy appeared. Uh, I mean, so how do you do you study the representation of this generalization of, of Virasoro, and do you get this as really the dimension of, of creating the states, or or this is actually that's related? an open question. We are studying this now. So the, the, we expect exactly what you just said, that if you have this uh, so-called coadjoint orbits of this uh, algebra, new algebra, then you find the volume of that uh, coadjoint orbits, you would uh, expect to get the entropy. So th that's the idea. That's how we think that we can carry out the microstate counting. We are not identifying the microstates, but you can do the counting over the count counting of the representations, the volume of the representation. Any others? Okay, I, can, I could ask or say something. In a dynamically evolving black holes, because the time scale is associated, so you have to cause grain in energy to get entropy. Namely, that entropy is entropy density. Okay? For extreme black hole, it could be like a degeneracy in ground state. Okay? Mm -hmm. so it could be really like a real That's degeneracy. Do you agree? So it's very yes, different. You cannot yes, see the dynamical yes, yes, aspect yes. In, in, in this but, way. But, uh, the idea why uh, extremal black holes could be relevant to a generic uh, black hole uh, microstates is exactly that if you identify the theory here, that would be the ground state of that would be theory, and then you have the theory you can presumably uh, go to non extremal case. For well, some purpose, it's useful, yes. Okay. So you need to have some control. For generic black hole, uh, you have little control, so it's a very hard problem. Okay, it's thanks, speaker again.